Welcome to my mini lecture on Julie Patton, and I'm specifically going to focus on her poem, Earth or the World in Progress. Before progressing further, it's worth even meditating on the title of the poem, which is also the opening line, and how her poetry changes the way words come out of our mouth. It changes the way our mouth contorts. Uh, I hope you're reading this at home. Earth or the world in progress. How does your mouth have to contort to articulate world? Um, it's interesting to read it multiple times and how our mouth transforms in different ways as Patton makes us articulate syllables that we're not used to seeing adjacent to each other as she's combining the word worry and world into one and creating a new world, a new word rather, a neologism. As we read in our Big Energy Poets book, Patton describes her own work as, quote, impermanent, improvisatory, occasional, and difficult to publish site-specific work. Um, a few things to think about, and as you read her poetry as a whole, that her poems are always emerge out of specific spaces and places. Um, and to think about what could seem like abstract reflections, what spaces and places is she gathering the material for her poems? Her work has an improv quality to it, which we'll discuss more, and that it's impermanent. It's built not to last. And in that sense, her poetry is very much informed and animated by ecological principles, right? Nothing is made to last forever. If we turn to Patton's poetics, which we find on pages 160 to 161, she be begins um, her explication on her poetics as following, quote, I wish to say that my compositional process and eco-poetics statement are one. Um, I think it's really important that the way she composes, the process of composition, composition is inextricable from her eco-poetics to her ecological um, principles and philosophy. And in fact, I think by putting eco-poetics almost adjacent to the phrase compositional process, we start to read the word compositional differently. We start to hear the word compose or composite sharing the same sort of root. And that to think about how composition and composting share the same etym etymology. And these two processes are intertwined and connected in really profound ways to meditate upon. Further down on the page, we read, quote, I can't stand waste. My poems are compost, Improvisa improvisations, live fermentation, visual trash, trash heaps. Um, again, we see the word compost and compositional, which reinforces that we should read compositional differently. And again, this is what poets do at their best. They refigure how we see everyday ordinary language. They change the way we understand words and even say words, um, as our example with world exemplified. Um, but let's go, kind of go back and unpack this phrase a little bit more. I can't stand waste. Patton doesn't recognize garbage. She does a lot of her work in various trash heaps and uses those scraps to build art, to engage in the process of creation. In fact, she calls her poems a type of compost. And I want you to think about that as you analyze her poetry. How is she composting? How is she improving with found language? Um, how does her poems, when you look at them on the page, they re re resemble visual trash heaps? But again, I think this is so important to highlight and reiterate. For her, trash does not mean garbage. It means soil upon which that, that can be, which new life can flourish, right? Um, that trash fuels the creative process, just like what we throw away can fuel new forms of life. 
I also want to say a few words about what this poetics is abandoning, right? By Patton calling her works a type of improv, she's abandoning the concept of mastery, right? This is not the perspective of the author with a capital A controlling all elements of language, of the poem, of, of literature. Again, there's an improv element. She's foregrounding the act of composting, of taking waste. This is the artist as uh, a, a participant in the ecological world rather than this autonomous, self-reliant author with a capital A. And in this sense, she is an ecological poet that's always engaged in site-specific uh, creative processes that are deeply engaged with what other people see as trash and using that trash to fuel a creative process and fueling new perspectives and philosophies. And in fact, further down, the poem we're going to look at, and I want you to analyze for this week, is on page 152, um, which we can read together. Earth or the world in progress, tattered tales edgy up in the air, enter action with words, names, places, splices, Wild edges, wiggle room, glad rage, pav arty, primitive remake, poesthetic life as prayer, warrior, flagging behind the road to hell paved with good intentions, the map of which war no longer air. So I want to give us some of the technical terms to help us make sense of this poem, beginning with homonym. A homonym are words with identical pronunciations, but different spellings and meanings, such as two, two, and two. If we go back to the poem, the last two lines read, the map of which. Uh, the word which, we can hear, I think, which, W-H-I-C-H, which way are you going, but it's written as which, W-I-T-C-H. So one way to make sense of this poem is to identify some of the homonyms and to think about why does this poem why does this poem use homonyms? How is it making us think differently? And again, the use of homonyms is going to change the meaning, not just of the word itself, the homonym, because there's two different meanings happening simultaneously, but also the context in which it occurs, right? The map of which war no longer err. How does that homonym of which, or maybe even war, right? We think of war as a homonym. I'll have you think about that. How does it change the meaning? In conjunction with identifying the homonyms, the other thing I think we could look for is the neologisms. A neologism is a formation or the creation of a new word to forge new meaning or meanings. Um, and maybe to help us see that, if we look at the word neologism, neo is new. And uh, you see the root of logos, which is word, right? So it's like literally means a new word. What new words do we see Patton creating? And why does she create these new words? One example of neologism that we see in this poem, and there are many, is poverty. And we see what Patton is doing, um, the common word poverty, she's transforming by replacing the vowel E with A. And what we start to hear in the middle of poverty is art, which is also enhanced by capitalizing the A in the mist, in the, in the center of this word. Um, and just to start to think about how you can start to begin to analyze neologisms by placing art in the midst of poverty, she's challenging us to think about from which spaces does art emerge um, rather than art being in the exclusive domain of wealth or money. Uh, hanging in uh, multi-million dollar museums. Art, perhaps at its most important, but definitely at its most political and urgent, is emerging from poverty. So this is a type of example of analysis you could do by looking at the neologisms that Patton developed. So your assignment, if you choose to look at Patton's poem, is, to, is at least to begin with, analyze the neologisms and homonyms in either this poem or any of Patton's poems from our book, or even her poetics. 
Um, other things you could do in conjunction if you feel inspired is to think about how sound is operating or any of the other themes that I've broached in this mini lecture. Thank you for your time as always, and I, look, I greatly look forward to your reflections and any questions you may have.